And my name is Danae Reed, and I'm so blessed to be here with the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, introducing our new show, A Millennial Voice Live, where I'll be your weekly host. Now, I'll be interviewing people across the country about the cool things that they're doing in their lives, in the lives of others, in their community, and so forth. So check that out every Sunday around 2 p.m. Now, make sure that you're following us on all of our socials. We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have it all. So make sure that you're following us on everything. Also check out our website, www.phyllisun.com, where you can find our weekly paper. Or if you want to get it in print version, that's an option too for just $40 a year. Make sure that you guys are supporting Black businesses. Again, my name is Danae Reed. I'm here with The Sun, and thanks for watching. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so glad to be here. I, I'm Cheryl Starr. Um, I do on camera work for various news outlets. I'm a lifestyle expert, expert, excuse me. I cover beauty, tech, and fashion. I also have a day job where I work in marketing and advertising for global brands, uh, which is really great. And then I also advocate for foster care youth across the country. And so that's just a little bit about me, but I'm excited to dive in with you. Perfect. Being in foster care is traumatic. You're moving from home to home. I myself was in six different homes in six different wow. years. Wow. Uh, and so like you're and never I'm having- How many years did you say? Six, six. Six. Wow. So I, yes, exactly. So I actually went to six different schools in six different years. And so okay. that's not a lot of moves like uh, for foster care. That is, I've known youth who've, who've moved 21 times. Um, who have been moved 21 times. Like the, the six is not a lot um, in for some of the youth I've talked with and spoken with. So, but that's traumatic to move, yeah. move that much and, and, and to never have a place of your own and always sort of being start, always being starting over, always be starting over. And so um, for me, uh, you know, as an adult, I've taken it upon myself to get a therapist, go to therapy regularly, try to talk, talk out sort of my frustrations, the challenges that I was having um, and to try to overcome those uh, but not all youth actually get to that point where they can actually take a moment breathe and see what they really need for their own mental wellness and it, it's something that I think is a disservice to so many youth if you are in foster care you should automatically be allowed to visit a therapist you should also automatically have someone that you can talk to because like I said it is very traumatic um, they say that foster care youth actually suffer for, from PS. PTSD at higher rates than soldiers, than people who go to war. Um, and so just think about that for a moment. Like you got all of these youth who are walking around um, who are just feeling, you know, abandoned, let down, mad, frustrated, angry, because when you're in foster care, um, you know, you end up being in foster care, not because you yourself have done anything wrong, but because something as bad has happened to you. So either you've been abused or you've been neglected. Um, and that's a lot to deal with, you know, when you're a child. So yes, I can totally speak to the mental health. I think um, everyone needs to be in therapy, not just foster youth. Everyone needs to have a therapist and talk to and get things off your chest, but especially someone who's gone through a traumatic experience like foster care. Wow. I'm just so stuck on the fact that six moves isn't considered a lot. So I can only I, can, I mean, you know, those are our, obviously our fundamental years. So I can only imagine what that does to a child who has no sort of sense of stability. Exactly. You have How no ties that, to your family. Yeah. How has that affected you, you know, into your adulthood? So, you know, um, I would say when I first started out, especially um, early on in my career, uh, you know, I had a, a lot of trouble like trusting people. Um, and so that could be a bad thing. And it could also be a good thing because I have, I have examples to give you for both sides when it was bad and when it was good. Um, but, you know, you have this like, challenge of trying to build trust with people. You don't trust people off the bat. You go with your gut a lot of times. Okay. Um, and so that was very challenging, especially going into new environments where, you know, you you know, one team, one dream. And then you go to like a, a professional environment. It's like, I don't know you. Why would I trust that you're going to have my back? There's no reason for that. And so that's something that I had to learn to sort of cope with um, and figure out and sort of, you know, take people at face value. Um, and, and it's a survival tactic to not trust people when you're in foster care, because you get let down again and again and again, your people lie to your face again and again and again. And so you, it's something you develop. So me, myself, that was something that I had to overcome, learn to work around um, in order to progress in my career. Um, and again, sometimes these, these things like not wanting to trust people right off the bat has kept me out of some very bad situations. Um, just being like, mm, my, your vibe is all off. I'm yeah, just going to take a step back. Vibe, so yes. I, I <laughs> so there are situations where it has been right, but there are situations where it was holding me back. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to sort of see the difference between the two. Yeah. I was going to ask, how did you, how do you decipher between the two? And like, what have you done to overcome and kind of, you know, surpass that part of your life? 
Yeah, I would say, like, again, therapy was very helpful for me. Um, how I learned to sort of see between the two is I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I'm very a watch, but uh, confirm. I'm very, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you, but like, I'm not going to go all in. Like, we're going to take these baby steps to get to that point where like, we are riding for each other. Um, and, and I think that has served me very, very well. Um, but again, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, but I also, I, I'm, uh, my husband makes fun of me all the time. He's like, you don't give people second and third chances. Like, nope, yeah. <laughs> you burned me once. Like I, I gave you the benefit of the doubt. You burned me. We're done. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, that's just sort of how I've learned to survive. And that has served me very well. Right. Okay. So, um, in your primal years when stability was complete, uh, completely lacking, as you said yourself, how have you found stability in, you know, your life in general after that? Like, what have you done to be able to feel some semblance of stability? Because I can understand how hard that might be for someone like you. You know, it was very, uh, when we talk about stability and not having it, um, you know, it's funny the things you don't really think about until you're reflecting on your life. Okay. Um, when I graduated college, one of my big things was I was like, I want to own my own house. I want to own my own house. I want to own my own condo. So I worked like crazy after I graduated school. I worked um, my full-time job. I worked two part-time jobs. I worked weekend jobs um, so that I could buy my first condo. So I bought my first condo at 25 years old. Um, and the Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm in my, my house now with my husband and, you know, uh, big moves. Yay. Um, but that first house for me or that first place uh, to call my own was because I didn't have that growing up. And so I, that was a real like drive in me to own a place that I could decorate, that I could have my own things in, that no one could. as a symbol. For you. Exactly. It really, it really did. And if you would have asked me when I was 25, why, why are you trying to work so hard to buy a condo? I had no idea. But as I reflect now, that was a big driving force. The fact that I just didn't have that type of stability growing up. Um, and so I would say that is sort of how it sort of come to life for me and try to create those, those semblances of, of stability, of family. Um, you know, I say all the time, my friends are my family. Like the, I, I have some real ride or die girlfriends, my husband, um, you know, I've been able to build a family around me. Um, but that took time to actually see the sort of values that I wanted to have in the people who were surrounding me that were going to be part of my tribe. Um, cause I wanted to make sure we were sharing the same values that we were going to be driving each other that we were going to be like pushing each other uh and i've been able to create that but it really sort of took those baby steps and and really wanting to create what i didn't have um and being wanting to lean into okay i'm gonna make this for myself right well it seems that you've been able to take you know the troubles that you've had in your past and kind of use them to fuel you to uh to become the woman that you've become today you know you have the condo you have the house you have the husband so tell us a little bit about your journey your career journey now we're gonna like switch gears a bit yeah, yeah. So my career journey. So I started out, um, I graduated from college, um, which a lot of foster youth don't do. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think only 5% of foster youth actually graduate college. Like it's a very, very small number. Um, and again, you had to have the deck stacked against you, um, you know, from day one. But, um, you know, I, I went to college, I graduated uh, and I started working in PR because I went to school for public relations. Uh, and then I sort of switched. Uh, so I worked in PR for a few years and I expanded my skill set to work in PR and marketing. And then from there, I started working in advertising. So just um, in marketing, but a little broader. Uh, and, you know, I, now I'm, I'm like deep into advertising. I was recently the director of content innovation at Essence Global. Yeah. So thank you. Pretty, a pretty big role, but I got laid off for the pandemic, but that's okay. Cause I got a new job. I can't say where it is just yet, but I started on the ninth. Okay, blessings. <laughs> thank you. Blessings. Exactly. But I started on the ninth with a new role that will be even bigger and a global position. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, it really was sort of um, going to school for a specific skill set and then learning how to pivot and apply that skill set to different opportunities that presented themselves over the years. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. So what, why marketing? Like, what do you love about marketing? I love telling stories. Okay. Uh, I am a big storyteller. I love telling stories. I love reading a good story. Um, you know, it's what I do again for my day job, marketing, advertising. It's what I do when I do my on camera um, lifestyle uh, work as well. When I'm on like NBC or when I'm on a Fox five talking about the latest in fashion trends or beauty trends, it's all storytelling. It's all, you know, trying to get people really engaged in whatever it is I'm talking about um, and really get to them to see themselves in that. And so I love doing that on 
on the marketing side. And I love doing that in my own camera work as like a lifestyle expert. Mm, well, I can see the passion and I can hear it in your voice. And I'm oh, sure, um, I don't know how old you were in foster care. How old? Uh, so, a, so the years are blurry because I was really young, but anywhere between ages like three or four, four all the way to like 12, 11, 12, um, that time period. Well, I'm sure you're making her very proud. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So what, would you what would you consider your biggest accomplishment as of late? I know you've like worked with, you know, a whole bunch of major networks and you've done the whole marketing thing, but what would you consider your biggest uh, accomplishment at this point? Uh, you know, my biggest accomplishment is, I think at this point is getting over my own fear about telling my story, like my own personal story and sharing that. Um, it's so empowering to uh, be able to share my story, to tell what it was like to be in foster care and then advocate for other youth who are still in care and still going through the foolishness that I went through when I was in care years ago. And so um, I, I just find it, find it so empowering um, and I'm so like just thankful and I feel blessed to be able to do that and do that type of work um, more than anything else. Like honestly, I just did an interview with GMA, Good Morning America on foster care. And I, I am just thankful that I'm able to um, speak on behalf of others who don't get those opportunities and to let you know the world just know what's actually happening to youth who, again, are, are just vulnerable members of our society who have done nothing wrong, but get put into these situations. And when you need a caring adult to look out for you, they don't have them. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. So can you shed a little bit of light on what it's like to be a kid in foster care? Yeah, it's, um, you know, being a kid in foster care, it's very difficult. Um, again, you, yeah. most of the time you don't know why you're in foster care. I, again, I was a little different because I did know why I was in foster care. My great grandmother, who I was living with, was sick. She was old. She was my great grandmother. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being sick at that sort of age, um, I had to go into care, which I believe was my first time. Mm -hmm. um, but most of, the, most of the youth in care don't really know why they're in care. No one actually takes the time to tell them what, what was going wrong. Um, and so, you know, you, you have this feeling like you've done something wrong. Um, you're moving from home to home. So you, you don't ever want get, to get too comfortable in one place. Um, the resources that should be uh, there for you are a lot of times are not, they're not granted to you. Um, you're a child, so you don't know what resources you should be getting versus what you shouldn't be getting. A lot of people try to make you feel like, they try to tell you that you should feel grateful for what you have when like, you, you know, when you're not being taken care of, you yeah. know, when you're not being treated like other children around you. Uh, and so you have all of these like, just like challenges that you have to get through. Um, plus, depending on the home you end up in, a lot of foster youth end up in sometimes worse situations than they left. Um, and so, you know, having to deal with that as well, um, you know, not everyone who is a foster parent is in it for the right reasons. Um, I pray that more and more people do become foster parents and they become foster parents for the right reasons with a lot of, I won't say a lot of times, but there are a number of times, a number of times, um, where foster youth end up in homes that are worse than what they've left. And so these are just some of the challenges that like they have to overcome to like survive. Yeah. And, and so I just want to circle back a bit. So you said uh, for a long time, you were kind of fearful of sharing your story. Uh, why is that? You know, it was a, uh, for me personally, and I think a lot of you feel this too. It was a guilt. It was a shame mm -hmm. uh, of saying that I was in foster care. And I can just remember, think back to moments when I was in high school or even when I got my first, my first job. Um, and I actually told my boss and we were, I don't remember what we're talking about, but growing up and I happened to mention that I was in foster care and her entire face changed. Like it, literally I could see it on her face and she was trying to work out what that meant. And I could just see the negativity there. And so for a long time I was like, I can't tell anyone that I was in foster care. I can't tell anyone that I work with that I was in foster care because I don't want it to change mm -hmm. how they treat me. Um, I don't want them to feel like they can't trust me because people have all of these misconceptions about youth in foster care. You know, they, assume they, they equate youth being in foster care with being juvenile delinquents and it couldn't be further from the truth that's not to say youth in foster care don't end up as juvenile delinquents but that's because there is this pipeline where you're not getting any of the resources that you're supposed to get and then you try to figure out life for yourself and might end up in trouble but youth don't end up in foster care because they've done something wrong they end up in foster care because something wrong has been done to them yeah. um, or around them you know something bad has been going on and so for me, it was a real shame and a fear of I won't progress in my career 
if I talk about this, um, people are going to judge me um, for not coming from a stable home or having a, a stable background or a nuclear background or traditional background. And so it was this real shame and fear. And it took a while for me to get over that. Mm. Wow. Wow. And so how would you say that your past ties into your present? Um, you know, I, I think my past, um, especially now, has given me purpose in my present. Um, you know, now that I, I've overcome that fear, that, that worry about shame, like, I don't care what people think. I'm like, you want to think that whatever you want to think is fine. I'm going to do my best to educate you on what foster care is like. But I would say it has given me passion to talk about these things, to, you know, use my platform, even if I'm talking about beauty or fashion, you know, I'm going to pitch my producer stories on foster care as well, which is actually how the GMA interview happened. I'm like, here's some fashion you know, trends that we cover. Here's some beauty ones. And here's the fact that uh, foster care youth are aging out into homelessness during the pandemic. I think this would be a really great story for us to cover. And so, you know, like I, I'm going to use my platform. And so just having that, um, the fact that I know I have not all the doors, but I've got a few doors and a few windows open to me. I've been able to leverage that and to speak about things that I really, really care about. I care about beauty. I care about fashion. I care about technology, but I also care about youth who are in foster care and ensuring that they have what they need. And so I would say it just, it's, it's given me um, this passion and it's made my passion clear um, and my purpose clear, a lot clearer. Yeah. And you know, what's, what's funny I shouldn't say the word funny. I hate when I, I hate when I use that term because it's really not the right word to use. But what's right. interesting, I think that's a really bland word too, but for lack of a better word, what's interesting to me is that I didn't really consider how COVID might affect uh, foster, foster children. So can you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah, yeah. No, a lot of people, you know, to be fair to a lot of people and everyone, we're all going through this like trauma together. Like this pandemic is traumatizing. We're all like, it's a, it's a global trauma that we're all experiencing. So, and there is a lot to pay attention to, um, you know, with everything happening in, in our government, um, with everything just happening around the world. Um, so, you know, I don't fault anyone who's not aware of what's happening specifically to foster youth. That being said, yes, um, COVID has, has, impacted negatively impacted foster youth because they are literally aging out into the streets right now because there's no place for them to go as far as housing because there's always waiting lists um shelters if you were able to get a shelter in a shelter before you're not getting on now because everyone has to social distance and so there are fewer people in shelters so they are over they are packed and overcrowded mm -hmm. um you can't get a job so um you age out you can't get a job to work so what are your options like you're literally aging out into the streets and honestly in a average year, there's a normal year, no COVID, no pandemic, um, 40 to 60% of youth end up homeless within 18 months of aging out in a normal year. So no. add COVID, add the pandemic, they are literally aging out into the streets. Um, and so, you know, that's something that um, CASA, which is a court appointed special advocates, I'm on the board of CASA in New York City, and they are an organization that helps foster care youth. Um, they've been very vocal about trying to pause aging out, not only in New York, but just around the country. There's also legislation um, that has been uh, presented supporting foster youth and families through the Pandemic Act. Of course, it's stalled because everything in the House and Congress is stalled, um, but that would pause aging out for youth and allow youth who have aged out within the last year to get back into care because you need services right now because, again, you can't get a job. You, there's no place to live. Like, how are you supposed to survive? Um, and so, like, it's a big issue across the country currently, um, but people aren't necessarily seeing it because there's just so much to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah. And so what can people like me do? Um, um, Hands down. If you want to help, email, text, tweet your legislators. Um, please do that. Your governors, your legislators, um, and ask them to back this bill. I, I'm sorry, back this legislation. It's not a bill yet. Ask them to back this legislation. Um, ask, ask them directly to pause aging out in your city, in your state. Um, and number it's eight, eight states and the District of Columbia have suspended aging out, but that means the rest of the country, the majority of the country, hasn't. Go so ahead. you're aging out into the street. So they will only, you know, they will do things if we are loud about it. So tweet them, email them, call them, please do that because you can't, like if you are living on the streets, you don't have a phone, you yeah. don't have access to email, you can't advocate for yourself. So we need other people to advocate for them. Mm. 
Well, thank you so much for all that information. Yes, I yes. It gave me so much to even just think about. You've put like so much into perspective for me, things that I never even thought about because I have never, I'm not a foster child. I've never um, had that experience. And so, you know, my own ignorance, that's something that I've just never really given too much thought, which is why I was really excited to talk to you um, about you know, who you are and how you got to where you got to right now because you're doing amazing things. Um, it's great that you found that stability that you've been craving for so long. Uh, I, that's so beautiful to me and I'm so happy for you. Um, that being said though, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on that I was not able to um, come up with on my own? You know, I think um, we've touched on quite a bit, you know, like I said, a, a big thing for me is, is ensuring that people and people around me are getting the mental health that they need. And so making sure that everyone knows it's okay to go to therapy. It's okay to talk to, uh, you know, someone about any challenges you might be facing. We are all going through a global trauma, like I said, together. So we should all be talking to someone right now. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, there is no shame in it at, at all. So that is just something I want to leave your, your, your fans with. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so, so much for coming and talking to us. Um, I This was an amazing episode, and I'm really excited that you were like my second slash first guest because I just feel like I learned so much today. Oh, well, I am so, so glad, and thank you for having me. And, of course, you know how to reach me at Cheryl Star at Instagram, or you can go to Cheryl Star at my website for anything else. But thank you for having me. Oh, well, that wraps up our first episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to my first episode of Millennial Voice, the first of many. I won't be back next week. Uh, because it's my little brother's birthday, but I'll be back September 13th with another amazing guest. And I won't spoil too much because I like to keep the surprise going. But in the meantime, please make sure that you guys are checking out the Sun's articles. We have so many talented writers, including myself. Please feel free to check out our, um, our articles that come out every Friday. Or like I said earlier, if you want to get it in print version, $40 a year and it could be yours. Thank you.